welcome all of you to uh, what we call Delhi Evidence Week. Uh, and I'm proud to say that we're so efficient, we're going to do this week in a day and a half. So we have a conference this afternoon and tomorrow. And the title of this conference uh, is Using Evidence to Tackle Development's Wicked Problems. Uh, I didn't think of that name, but my colleague said, if it's about wicked problems, we want to have you as our keynote speaker. So uh, with that, um, let me just say that uh, I'll, uh, after uh, I say a few words, we're going to have two sessions this afternoon, which will be here in the Eros uh, Hotel. Uh, one is a, a panel that will be moderated by Ian Goldman uh, on um, doing and making impact evaluations. What does it take? Uh, then there'll be a, a break, and then uh, there'll be an, another uh, session on impact evaluations. Are they ready to tackle developmental problems, wh wh which will be moderated by uh, Richard Manning? Um, Ian and, and Richard are here as part of 3IE's uh, Board of Commissioners. Richard is the chair. Um, and what we've tried to do during these uh, board meetings is to actually have events that will ha start a two-way conversation between our commissioners and the evaluation community in the city, but also the other way around. Okay? So with that, I have the great pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker, who happens to be me. Uh, and uh, when my, my colleagues, uh, you can barely see me with this thing, so let me stand here. Um, when when uh, my colleagues uh, and I were thinking about what I should say in my first public lecture here in, in Delhi, uh, we thought, uh, well, what is the one question that people have most asked you when you've come? Uh, and they've put this in slightly different ways, some more politely than others, but it goes something like this. Why does an organization uh, that has three I's in its name, not one of which stands for India, in this country? <laughs> so what I want to do is to talk about why is it that countries like India uh, are really important for impact evaluation, but also the other way around. And to be honest with you, uh, the exact location of 3IE was, as you can imagine, a bit accidental. There are a lot of institutional reasons. But it was very important the, for, that the board of, initial Board of Governors thought that 3IE should be based in the South, a southern country of importance and uh, that was emerging as a world leader. And I don't know how many of you saw this picture just about the time that I arrived in Delhi, actually, about two and a half months ago. This is a picture of uh, the leaders of uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, which are called the BRICS countries. And what's important about this picture, other than they're actually very lovely and handsome in that picture, all these leaders, um, is that it's symbolic uh, from an economic perspective because what these uh, leaders were doing was launching uh, a new development bank, which uh, others call the Brinks, BRICS Bank. Uh, to, uh, and that's important economically for a lot of countries which uh, are trying to uh, invest more in infrastructure. But it also has uh, an important uh, geopolitical symbolism. I'll read to you, uh, according to the Times of India, uh, uh, the report, that the, uh, this bank was, quote, conceived as a counterbalance to US-led financial institutions like the World Bank and IMF by providing funding for infrastructure and development projects in BRICS countries. Each nation will have an equal say in the bank's management, regardless of GDP size, according to officials." Unquote. So this aspiration uh, to be not just an economic player, but a geopolitical one, is really beneficial to an organization like ourselves, because these are the leaders of tomorrow uh, in, among the emerging countries. So in this talk, I just want to stress four points, that just as these BRICS countries are important to organizations like 3IE. I think that BRICS countries could also use what 3IE produces, organizations like 3IE produces, because they need learning to sustain inclusive growth. Okay? 
that this learning requires rigorous evaluation, as we define it. There's been, in fact, a lot of progress in this, uh, but there's a lot more to be done as well in countries like India and the three IE sent ready to help. Okay? So those are just the four points I want to make. Okay, first one, what are these BRICS? Uh, so the, coin, the term BRICS was coined in 2001 by Goldman Sachs uh, in a uh, publication uh, by, I think, the vice president uh, for strategy, Jim, Jim O'Neill. Uh, in fact, it was just BRIC before, and South Africa came later. I'm sorry, Ian. Uh, uh, and the idea then was that if you looked at where these countries were going, how, how these countries were growing in the year 2000, you can see that their annual growth rates were at least comparable, if not exceeding, the growth rates of the traditional powers of the US, Japan, and Europe. Okay? And this is really uh, a change, a sea change, because all these countries were just coming out of the 1997 financial crisis. And there was a sea change in perception that perhaps in the future in the world, at least that's what Goldman Sachs said, uh, that uh, we need to look at these countries as the emerging leaders of the world economy. Now, over the next 10 years, um, you can see that the growth rates and performance of these five countries made Goldman Sachs look almost prophetic <laughs> because their growth rates uh, range from about 35 to 10%, okay? whereas the traditional economic powers were limping along at 1% to at most 2% a year. And by the year 2000, you can see uh, India had a growth rate of 10%, which, as you might recall, as late as last April, the finance minister was calling perhaps the new normal for India. Now, if you're going to go to one of Delhi's many construction sites and launch a brick into the air, it'll soar for the first couple of seconds, but eventually we know what will happen. So it turns out, despite this growth, that after 2010, our growth rates started to decline, and quite precipitously for some countries. So China is the top line in this of average annual growth. And you can see it was, went from about a little over 10% uh, to about 8.5%, uh, which for China as you can imagine, is pretty anemic, which would be, of course, enviable to everybody else. The next line is India, okay? A much more precipitous, but it's managed to bounce back. And then um, you have Brazil, which is now reaching uh, the zero growth, uh, and then uh, Russia and, and South Africa. So one lesson is that uh, BRICS can't soar forever, okay? And in fact, if you look at the prognosis for the future, uh, you'll see that uh, the new normal that the finance minister talked about may not take place. In fact, um, it's not, perhaps not even going to be uh, about 8%. Uh, I went to a talk to, uh, by uh, Shankar Acharya, the former uh, uh, Chief Economic Advisor of the Government of India just a couple of weeks ago at the Habitat Center, uh, who said that because the world economy is in fact uh, uh, being, struggling itself, that that normal is probably about 2% higher than it, than it should be. Okay. So growth needs to be sustained, and people have to find ways to make sure it does. It's not just economic growth as well. There's a challenge for inclusion. If you look at social indicators, okay, such as uh, maternal mortality, infant mortality, and the Human Development Index that's developed by the UNDP, you can see that the BRICS countries are not the top performers along this dimension. Okay. In fact, a country like uh, India, it, in terms of infant mortality per 1,000 live births, is just about the average for all lower middle income countries, not the high performer that uh, we thought, okay? So the question is, how does one sustain inclusive growth for the future? Uh, the World Bank, where I used to work, i own up to that, uh, commissioned one of its uh, uh, stellar panels of Nobel laureates in economics, uh, 
very prominent professors uh, that was chaired by Mike Spence uh, uh, in 2008 on uh, uh, trying to look at the experience of various countries. Uh, they spent a couple of years and several million dollars uh, to try to look at the experience of various countries to see what does it take to sustain economic growth. After all that time and money and brain power, they came up with the rather anemic statement that it's hard to know. <laughs> uh, in fact, it's hard to know how an economy will respond to a policy. Okay? And the right answer at any present moment may not apply in the future. Okay. That's not good news for uh, an economy that wants to sustain growth indefinitely. And in fact, if it wants it to be a new normal, the only country that's probably managed to do this over a few generations is China, going at about 8 to 10 percent. Okay. Um, so this has led a lot of analysts, uh, including uh, economists and others, to think about maybe there is not one model of economic growth that we should be seeking, and that perhaps development is not a sea change in philosophy that you need to apply, and that there certainly is not one model for this, but it may be, in fact, uh, a series of small developments of projects and programs, some of which work and some of which don't. And what countries need to do is to try them out in their own setting to see if it works, and then scale them up if they do, or cut them down if they don't, and try other things and keep trying. This is uh, the mo one of the mo more famous uh, uh, expounders of this uh, thesis is a good friend of mine named Bill Easterly, William Easterly of, of NYU, uh, who has been also famously been known as criticizing the development aid agencies for trying to come up with the big think model of, of development. Um, so um, now, I don't necessarily, even though Bill's a good friend, uh, subscribe to this theory. Uh, as the one overarching re development model. Uh, but you have to admit that perhaps some other countries have tried this successfully. Okay? And there is a school of thought which says that the way China has developed was precisely by this trial and error method, okay? at least since 1980. Uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, is, of course, uh, famous as the one who started uh, the reforms in China uh, around 1980. But as early as 1962, he, come up, he came up with this famous statement called, it doesn't matter if a cat is black or white as long as it catches mice. Now, he may have been having rodent problems in his house, but a lot of the economic uh, profession thought that what he was actually saying was that there is no one model, even though he belonged to the Communist Party, okay, but that, that you have to have this trial and error. Uh, it took 20 years for, or 15 years for Deng Xiaoping to get over this statement because he was then uh, shipped off to the countryside in the Cultural Revolution, but eventually came back and started the process of reforms uh, in that country. And there have been many researchers who have actually looked at uh, the model in China, which was this decentralized model, but coordinated from the top in Beijing, but a decentralized model in which development is chi in China was a series of experiments uh, in which Chinese were constantly learning. So my first point is that perhaps one way that countries can grow, okay, is that they have to keep adapting, they have to keep learning, okay? And uh, to do that, you need to evaluate and to experiment. Now, when you experiment, of course, not all experiments turn out well, okay? Uh, we don't exactly know how many uh, fail because in, uh, there is also a debate in the academic literature that the only experiments you see, the majority of experiments that you see published are those that succeed. Okay. Uh, but I think that we can all probably agree that uh, most experiments wind up failing. But what actually makes society progress 
is the few that actually do, and lessons are, are learned uh, from it. So this is the case for evaluation. How do you learn lessons? You have to know whether or not the experiment worked. And secondly, you have to know why. And that's, in fact, what evaluation does. So that's my first point, is that even these fast-growing economies, um, uh, which don't have the hubris of saying there is one development model, can actually progress and develop uh, through a, uh, a, a method of trial and error, but they really have to make sure they evaluate. So that makes the case also for evaluation. The question is, the second point is why impact evaluation and what makes it rigorous? Um, let me uh, tell you a story uh, about one of the BRICS, Russia. Uh, this is from a story from my previous life. Uh, so I joined 3IE just a few months ago. I moved to Delhi last July. Uh, but before that, I was for many years, I will not say exactly how many, but it was a few decades, uh, at the World Bank. Uh, and in my last three years at the bank, my job was to be the head of the unit that evaluated all of the World Bank's projects in the public sector. Okay. So the World Bank takes evaluation very seriously. And uh, what they do is, in fact, at the end of every project that they finance, uh, they make the project officers, the one in charge, rate themselves. Do you think that there, there's, it's very complicated, there's a lot of ratings. Let me just say that do you rate yourself just like you would in an individual performance appraisal in, in, in your very HR, various HR departments as moderately succe fully successful, okay, or do you exceed expectations? Uh, my, my three IE friends will appreciate this, or are, are you below expectations, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So there's this health project in, uh, in Russia in the 1990s. As you, uh, after the fall of the uh, Soviet Union, uh, Russia was in pretty dire straits, and all the health indicators plummeted in, in, in Russia. So Russia at the time asked for World Bank help to see, based on the experience you've had in health reform in other countries, what might work in, in this country. And the, the World Bank said, we don't know exactly, but one of the things that other countries have tried is a decentralized uh, health systems, which there's a lot more leeway being given to the local authorities uh, so that they can identify the health problems in that uh, region as opposed to one national policy, and we can help you with this uh, project. Um, so uh, what they did was they chose two oblasts or regions or provinces in, uh, in Russia. Uh, to try this, uh, this out. And the indicator, uh, one of the indicators uh, that they were tracking uh, is the reproductive health of women. And that indicator is the rate of abortions per 1,000 women aged 15 to 49. So what this says is, is that, in fact, uh, at the start of the project in 97, um, these, this indicator was going down, which is a positive thing. You want fewer abortions per, per thousand women. So the, the team rated itself as fully having met expectations, okay? Uh, because in these two regions where they were trying this out, uh, the indicator was positive, okay? Health outcomes had improved, okay? Now, the evaluation unit then asked the question, hmm, that's very interesting, that might be right. And they asked one question. What was happening to the indicator before the project even started? Well, it turns out that indicator was going down at a faster rate <laughs> before the project started. Okay. So they said, hmm, let's ask another question. What was happening to the indicator in all the other regions in Russia? They were going down everywhere. <laughs> okay. And so as a result of this, we downgraded the project because we could not convince ourselves that even though the indicator had improved, okay, that it was due to the project. Okay. So what impact evaluation does is it tries to study changes in outcomes okay, that are attributable to the intervention. Okay. And not just because, it, in this case, uh, the question that was asked was, can you make sure that um, 
that was due to the project itself. Okay. And it asks two fundamental questions. And I, won't, uh, I, think I know some of, a lot of you are IE experts, so I won't go into this in great detail. Uh, but one is, one is what, what is the results chain? Uh, before I went into uh, the evaluation game at the World Bank, I spent most of my career being evaluated. Uh, so I was in charge of the human development projects in the Asia regions at the bank for about a dozen years uh, before going into, uh, into evaluation. And I used to wonder sometimes what my staff were thinking when uh, they promised certain outcomes or impacts of a project. And then I looked at what the project was actually financing. And I said, you must have made a lot of assumptions in going from one to the other. Let me give you an example. One example is, let's say you have a, um, a youth training project. And I typically would see that in some of these uh, outcomes that are being promised that in these er areas where we expect, the pro where the project is, we expect poverty rates to decline by so many percent. I said, okay, what are you financing? Well, you're financing textbooks you're financing the hiring of teachers and perhaps a building, okay, and perhaps some teacher training. Okay, now those are the inputs that are being actually being bought by the project. What are the assumptions that have to be made? You're, there are some assumptions that have to be made that those inputs somehow are combined into viable training courses, okay, that the uh, entity has the capacity to implement that, uh, that those uh, training courses uh, actually result in people coming, the youth coming, to take them. Okay. So those are the outputs. Okay. And the youth actually, uh, you make an assumption that as a result of having taken the course, they actually learn something. Those are the outcomes. And as a result of having learned something, they actually can get a job and lower poverty in that region. Okay. A lot of assumptions need to be made, and I ask the question, if I, the evaluation group comes back to us in uh, seven years' time and say, can you make this argument along this theory of change, will you be able to answer that? They told me, you'll be long gone, Manny, don't worry about it, in seven years' time, which is, about, which is an issue, by the way. But that's very hard to do. So that's one question that impact evaluation does. It, it makes you go through this logic chain that links inputs to impact. Uh, but as you can see, this might not happen because, uh, like in the Russia case, a lot of outside factors could have taken place, such as the whole country itself was growing, which is why those health indicators were improving over time. And it was not due to the project at all. But there are also other possibilities. Uh, it could be that uh, as a result of the Having offered this project, only the best people are coming to the project. Okay? Or it could be that the uh, government decides to put the project where it's more likely to succeed. So there's a selection bias. So it could, this, these are some reasons why you can't just, even if you were able to do the right comparisons, you can't just conclude that as a result of the outcomes having improved, that that was due to the project. Um, What's important in impact evaluation is the other question that's asked is, can you establish the counterfactual? Is what would have happened without the project? And that's why you need these comparators in order to correct for the outside factors, the selection by participants, selection due to program placement. And this is why there are two kinds of methods to do this. There are uh, experimental methods in which you can use uh, randomized control trials to assign people to uh, what they call control and treatment groups and then so that they're at least statistically comparable with, uh, uh, with each other or if you, you don't, can't do that there are quasi experimental groups which I won't uh, talk about here. So this is the reason why we need rigor not just evaluation but rigorous impact uh, uh, rigorous evaluations that are, we call impact evaluations. Now, what's the track record so far in developing countries? 
My colleagues have uh, uh, what they call a repository of all the impact evaluations that have ever been published since from 1980 to, I think it was uh, sometime this year, but we've been published um, a paper in, in 2014. And it turns out that there has been a dramatic increase in the number of these evaluations to try to address those questions that I pointed out earlier. You can see about 15 years ago, uh, around 2005, uh, there were about 100 per year. Now it's close to 450 a year. So there's been a dramatic, uh, a dramatic increase. Uh, some of this ha have been in South Asia, including here in India. And what I want to do now is to say that, look, uh, in fact, India has been doing some of these, and I want to just give you three quick examples uh, of where this kind of evaluation has been done and has yielded some very interesting results. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit later about how they've been, have been taken up. Okay, the three issues I want to talk about are pollution, combating pollution, improving learning, and fighting corruption. Sort of biggish issues here in India as they are in, in other countries. Okay. So the first story that I want to talk about is about the efficacy of regulations to reduce pollution emissions in Gujarat, India. So aside from traffic, one of the main things that uh, people talk to me about outside of work in, in Delhi is about pollution. Okay. Uh, and uh, not just about air, but, but, but other, other things. So it is, this is a big issue. It won't surprise you to know that, in fact, India has a lot of regulations that uh, try to control pollution. It also won't surprise you to know that enforcement is a problem of, of, of those. Okay? Uh, now, one of the ways, one of the issues in, in uh, pollution control is how do you monitor the th hundreds, if not thousands, of emitters of pollution. And the way that uh, many countries do it, not just India, by the way, is third-party audits. I was uh, experienced this firsthand when I, just before I moved to India, when I was trying to rent my house out in Bethesda, Maryland, in the United States. It turns out I found out if for me to rent my house out, I had to get uh, a lead inspection done because if you rent it out and there's lead, it could be very harmful to tenants. Okay, that's just a, a regulation. That didn't surprise me. What surprised me was I was expected to shop around for the, per, the inspector, okay, which I did online, okay, uh, and to pay that person. I said, hmm, that person's job, whom I'll identify and pay, is to report on me if I did something wrong to the authorities. It turns out, uh, when, by the way, my house was clean, it was fine, it was all in the up and up, no, no corruption at all. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it turns out that's the way that many regulations are done. Almost all environmental regulations, not just in India, but everywhere else is done through these third-party audits. What's really scary is that that's true in the financial sector. Okay. Uh, uh, that the financial institutions where we put all our money in actually also self-report. That's another, another matter. So in this project in uh, evaluation in, in, in India, what the, uh, was done in which the researchers work with the uh, Gujarat Pollution Control Board is to have a, uh, a project in which uh, they said, look, we're going to compare uh, how the auditors behave and pollution emissions if you do it the regular way, okay, uh, the possible conflict of interest way is what I'd call it, or a modified way in which the auditors are assigned to industries rather than being chosen by the firms, uh, that at least a portion of the audits were back-checked by somebody else, 20%, and the funds came not from the individual who was being tested, but from a central pool that they contribute to. So what were the results? The first is that there was more accurate reporting. Okay? So what this graph on the left shows is the particular, to spend the particular parts per million among the firms uh, that uh, use the standard method of audits and the modified methods. Okay? And this is what the back checking, the 20% uh, real pollution particulates were, uh, were. 
the maroon line shows you what the third party audit revealed. Okay? So you can see that the difference in the two is how accurate it was. Okay? And you can see in the standard way okay, uh, that it was a lot more inaccurate than it was in the modified way in which there was back checking and, and so on and so forth. Not only that, they found, the researchers found that the actual pollution uh, emissions declined over the entire sample. Okay. So there's an example, uh, according to the, uh, the researchers, of where a, uh, you can actually improve the performance through these uh, on pollution of the, uh, uh, by changing the incentives of the third party auditors. Okay. I'll give you another example of learning outcomes in Haryana. We all know that India has had success in improving uh, access to education. But there's a big concern that despite the high enrollment rates, there are poor outcome indicators, OK? Uh, there are these uh, indicators uh, that uh, 3 quarters of grade 8 students can read only at the grade 2 level, and less than half can complete grade 4 math problems. So um, India, of course, was recognized this. And uh, what, uh, one of the uh, programs that has been tried is called the Continuous and Comprehensive uh, Education Program. And what the CCE program tries to do is to move India uh, from, or in Haryana anyway, from this high stakes uh, testing uh, attitude in which uh, a lot of students were being taught to the test, uh, in which in this program teachers are given a rubric that will allow them to assess individual students and with the idea that they will then tailor their uh, learning uh, to the individual's case. Um, now, it turns out that uh, a group that you all know about, Pratham, thought that that was good, but that may not be enough. It doesn't give the teachers actually any tools to do something about it. And so what the Learning Enhancement Program tries to do is to provide materials through the Pratham Freed India program and, and training and a curriculum that will help them address this. So these are two complementary programs, and what the researchers uh, did was to say, look, we don't actually know if any of these things work. Or, so they randomly assigned some schools to just have the CCE program, some to just have the LAP program, some to have both, okay? and then compare that with a control group. And then they asked the question, what has happened during the life of the, uh, 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 of the project? Uh, in particular, what has happened to outcomes in education language and in math. Well, it was mixed results. It turns out that uh, in math, there was no difference at all in either CCE or the LEP relative to the control group. Okay. But in H Hindi language, there was a very large gain uh, through the LEP program in which uh, the teachers were being given the tools uh, to actually uh, affect kids' learning relative to the standard CCE program. So what the researchers concluded, at least in some aspects of learning in India, that uh, this kind of program can work. Let me just give you one last example. And that's combating corruption in the, uh, the largest social protection program in the world, I think. Because the uh, National Rural Gar Employment Guarantee Scheme affects some 50 million uh, individuals uh, in, uh, in, uh, in India. Um, now, even though the Employment Guarantee Scheme uh, uh, is very important in terms of ensuring that uh, I think there are 100 hours of employment at least uh, per month is available to uh, residents of rural areas. Uh, that uh, in Bihar, which is one of the poorest states, there's relatively low take-up rate. Okay. And this might be because in Bihar, people didn't know enough about this program. But the other possibility that people came up with is because of corruption that a lot in Bihar, at least, a lot of the village panchayats who were in charge of implementing the program didn't feel like they should apply for the program because they said that what, what was happening was that they got the money from the provinces only through district 
uh, and block officials who each asked for a cut. And by the time it got to them, it wasn't worth it. So what the researchers work with uh, the state to uh, devise a mechanism in which the uh, panchayats could apply on a website through technology directly to the state and bypassing the, the block and uh, the district levels. So what happened in this case? Well, the, the researchers compared average daily spending on the program. So there was no difference between the treatment and control villages uh, before the program took place. But during the intervention months in which there was availability of applying directly to the state, the spending in the treatment villages was 24% lower than those in the control villages. Then afterwards, after the program ended, that difference went away. Now, you may think, is that a positive result? That in fact, you're, this is a program that's supposed to increase employment, uh, but you're spending less. Well, the, there were no differences in employment between those villages in the control or treatment. So at, at the very least, the researchers concluded that you're getting the same employment output, but you're spending a lot less because you've taken away the payments in between. So there's, these are just good examples of things that have been done in India, uh, but much more remains to be done. Uh, and there are some missed opportunities as, uh, as a result of the fact that there's, even though some of these evaluations are done, there's uh, not yet a culture of ensuring that you learn from them. Uh, this is the number of impact evaluations ever. In, in some of the BRICS countries. You can see that India has more than uh, anyone else, okay? 260 in the repository, okay? Uh, that's 260 since 1980 to 2014. Uh, there are, in any given year, 100 um, government schemes alone <laughs> at the national level here in India. Uh, there are tens of thousands if you count uh, the schemes in the province, in the states, and in the, the district levels. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, there are also non-government entities uh, which are trying out various things. Uh, this just gives you an idea, uh, you know, if to the extent the development projects are somehow proportional to the population, uh, India, uh, Per, I'm, uh, it's the first time I used the word crore in any, in any lecture. Uh, <laughs> per 10 million population is about 2.1. Uh, and South Africa uh, uh, is actually higher uh, th than others. So there's still big, uh, big gaps. Not only that, but there's still a lot of very important programs in India that haven't been studied. And of these evaluations, most of them look at the outcomes only after a few years. Uh, after implementation as opposed to many years after, and we all know development is a long-term process. Um, the other issue in India, it, uh, as it is in many other countries, is that sometimes, uh, even if you have a good evaluation, um, it doesn't have any take up. Okay. Uh, here's an example of uh, an evaluation, uh, save a mandir, uh, of an NGO intervention to increase immunization rates by setting up immunization camps where you can get reliable uh, uh, vaccines through the cold chain, uh, and where, which also gave incentives in the form of lentils to families. And in this evaluation, uh, these camps and the lentil award led to uh, increases in child immunization rates that are very significant. Okay? Uh, people have looked at this evaluation and said that this is one of the most successful and policy relevant experiments in the last 10 years. But after eight years, after the study, there's been almost no take up and the uh, researchers who, are, who have done this are still trying to make, uh, to uh, plan more replication studies to show that this is a successful model. So it's not always the case that just because you have a really good evaluation that that will be taken up. So these two things, that there are still big gaps and that uh, countries need help in uh, taking up good evaluations is why 3IE uh, can possibly be of help 
in a country like India, which is my last point. So we're an uh, international grant-making nonprofit organization, and we fund rigorous evidence uh, to improve the effectiveness of programs. Our main office he is here in Delhi. We also have offices in Washington and London. Uh, this was established six to seven years ago. The way that we operate is that we provide grants uh, to fund rigorous impact evaluations through various what we call windows, which I won't explain. My colleagues can do that during the coffee break. Uh, but we also fund uh, what we call uh, evidence and reviews of, that are synthesizing, including systematic reviews of the literature and evidence gap maps. And uh, we support the enabling environment for evaluation uh, through uh, giving advice uh, to replications and also the repository that I talked about uh, earlier. Uh, so that's how we fill in gaps. Uh, the other way that we fill in a big, uh, we can provide a service here in a country like India is by bridging this gap between the researchers and the policy makers, which we work really hard at. And as we know, this is more of an art than it is a science. A lot of it is about incentives, that when you have researchers whose main objective might be to publish in uh, academic journals, uh, that may be a very different, that may lead to a very different result uh, from what policymakers want, which is, what, which is a timely result at a given time. And what 3IE does is make sure that uh, there is a, at least, if not a marriage, at least some dating, and we call it matchmaking, between the researchers and the policymakers. We also monitor whether or not there's been some influence. This is uh, fairly early on in the process uh, in which we're looking to see uh, different cases of where it is that uh, successful programs have been taken to scale, whether uh, programs have been closed if they don't work, Okay. Uh, whether there's been a change in program or policy design, whether they've informed other programs, whether they've informed the global policy discussion, and whether there's been an improvement in the culture uh, on, of the use of evidence. Just some examples of take up what's happened in the Gujarat case uh, is that the government uh, Pollution Control Board in Gujarat is actually studying ways to uh, implement the uh, uh, modified audit that was discussed earlier, and the researchers are working with other states to try out the same methodology. Uh, in the case of uh, Haryana, uh, they're also doing a further study of the CCE and how that can be reformed so that uh, it, can, uh, it can be improved. Uh, the study of the uh, Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme in Bihar is still fairly new. Uh, and I don't know if he's here yet, but he'll be coming later. Santosh Matthew from the uh, uh, Rural Development Ministry is going to be here. You can ask him, uh, actually, whether or not there's been any impact yet of this scheme. So with that, I'm just sum up by saying that there are four messages that I want to leave you with. One is that uh, BRICS being very important, they're going to be more important in the future, but if they want to sustain this growth and to really reach the aspirations that they have to catch up with the developing world is they need to learn that this learning has to include rigorous evaluations uh, and if they really want to make sure that they can attribute uh, some of those programs to uh, uh, what they've done. There's been a lot of progress in this, but much more to do in a country like India and CIE stands ready to help in that regard. Thank you very much.